This episode of Two Guys on Mobile is brought to you by Macadamian, helping companies transform ideas into compelling, market-ready products customers love. You can find them at macadamian.com. And by AppCelerator. Build cross-platform mobile applications in a cinch. Go to AppCelerator.com. It's time for Two Guys on Mobile, episode number 27. And you know what? Quite frankly, I don't even know what the date is today because it's been a blur of activity. I think it is actually what you call September 28th. And uh, it's a Wednesday. We're filming this live, two time zones between Jeff my, and myself. Um, of course, I am, I'm Rob Woodbridge from Untether.tv. And uh, currently sitting in a kitchen in sunny San Francisco after attending the um, GigaOhms Mobilize conference. And with me, as always, from his office in dreary, sunny Ottawa, Canada. It was sunny this morning, but I expected to get dreary, so I'm kind of hoping that uh, I get a pickup from work here today. So. Well, it's uh, from Ottawa, Canada. Obviously, Jeff Bacon found at the Swab Hog on Twitter and BaconOnTheGo.com. Um, and uh, this is a long time in coming. Again, we're just struggling to get uh, get the, the timing right. It's a busy season for both of us, and uh, you know we're, we're we're we endeavor to get this done uh, weekly, but sometimes it doesn't happen. But you can be sure that when we do connect, the news is always going to be relevant. It's going to be up to the minute. And uh, today couldn't have been a better day, I don't think, uh, to to actually get together on this. So um, you know we want to cover a couple of things. Actually, three things today. We want to talk about. The, the announcement this morning, um, and if you're watching this tomorrow, if it's not Wednesday and it's Thursday or Friday, the announcement that, that would have happened this week about uh, uh, Amazon and the launch of uh, Fire, but more specifically, we want to talk a little bit about their new browser technology, Silk. Amazon Silk. Fire and Silk. Um, we want to talk about, uh, I've just spent two days immersed in the mobile space here in, in San Francisco at the GigaOM Mobilize conference, and I want to kind of give it, give you a few takeaways of that, and some good conversation pieces, I think. I don't even think we're going to get through it. That's how much was covered in, in two days of mobile. Uh, it was like a, it was like a love-in for mobile. Uh, and then we also want to talk a little bit about the reasons to go mobile, and this is one of those questions that a lot of people are struggling with right now, as they throw a whole lot of cash and effort into something that we might might be considered futile. Uh, or no real benefit to that to that brand. I know that's it goes against what we've we've said from the beginning, but we want to cover that as well. So I, I think that's it, isn't it, Jeff? I think that's going to cover it, and we'll probably run out of time talking about just those three. I think so. Getting a little stuttering with you, so hopefully the uh, the bandwidth clears up. Uh, but um, why don't we just jump right into this? Uh, you know, w- Amazon has long been rumored. To actually be putting out a uh, a, a tablet, and uh, what we've ended up seeing this today, especially is um, you know, obviously the announcement by Bezos about uh, the best kept unkept secret in the industry, which is the Amazon Fire, which is this tablet. And uh, you know, this is not a hardware show, and uh, you know, I've maintained that hardware is not relevant, um, as relevant as the ecosystem that is wrapped around that hardware. Um, but uh, you know, this looks eerily familiar, doesn't it, Jeff? Yeah, you know, it's a rectangular 7-inch device that's black and doesn't <laughs> have any buttons on it. So, you know, we never seen any, one of those before. Well, we've never seen one of those execute properly before, right? Well, we'll see if this one has an email client on it or not. Well, you know what, I, I so I just, I read the specs. So this is obviously the Amazon Fire. It's their new tablet. Uh, specs are, you know, uh, I think V1, uh, everybody criticizes a V1, but uh, no 3G, just Wi-Fi, no camera, no microphone, um, but uh, eight, and eight, eight gigs of uh, storage, and yep. uh, you know, obviously a, a huge reliance on Amazon's AWS, Amazon's web service and the cloud services that they offer. This is a cloud device above and beyond anything else, and, and it, so it's limited, obviously. Yeah, I mean, but I mean, it's good. It's it's Amazon not trying to bite off more than they can chew, 
right? They're not trying to put out like the super phone slash tablet that you can make phone calls on, even though you're going to be holding up this page sized thing to your head or having it head, plug headphones in as soon as it rings. Or like they're they're not trying to go above what. Hello, hello. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they're not trying to go and be up above and beyond what they want to do with it, which is create a vehicle to sell their content. Like yeah. that's Amazon's total goal. As we've talked about this before, is they want to sell Amazon content or content from other people through Amazon. And they're putting a device together so that they can sell content to people. So whether that's books or movies or TV shows or audio or apps or whatever it happens to be, this tablet is designed around that. And so, you know, if you look at what Apple's put out, it's a much more multifunctional goal for their tablet. So they have a 3G and they have a Wi-Fi version of it, and it's it's focused on apps and there's email and calendar on it, and and the goal is much more um, encompassing in somebody's life for using their iPad, whereas Amazon's targeting more to when you're consuming content, it's here. If you want to make a phone call, or you're trying to communicate with other people, this isn't the device to do it on. No. This is a device to consume, not to create or uh, communicate. That's, uh, and there's a distinction there. So, you know, the idea that anything's going to be an iPad killer uh, right now, this is, this is one of those, uh, it's, the, it's the curse of death. And uh, so don't call it an iPad killer. But this is this is a a very 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 strong competitive threat for Apple's um, distribution, digital distribution, whether it's books, apps, TV, movies, any kind of media, MP3s or music. <clears throat> this this obviously is a threat to that more so than a threat to the to the iPad. Um, but ultimately, winning on the tablets uh, is is going to be different. Now the the one hundred ninety nine dollar price tag. Uh, what we saw with uh, the WebOS debacle with HP is that uh, 199 seems to be a sweet spot. 99 is the sweeter spot, and they also reduced the, the price of the Kindle down to basically the cost of two books, 79 bucks. Um, remember when this thing was 450 dollars, and I thought, what's the ROI on that? How many books would I have to get at nine dollars in order to be able to make up that 450 dollars? But 79 dollars now, all of a sudden, the Nook is dead, right? And I think even uh, up here, um, the Kobo reader is going to die as a result of the 79 bucks for uh, for an e-reader, and at some point that's going to be free. Um, you just you, you, know just... you know what's really interesting though is putting the price point on when you put a price point of like 400 dollars on some piece of hardware, people look at it and say, oh, you know what? It's hardware. It's new hardware. It's a TV. It's a DVD yeah. player. So whatever. Four hundred dollars. Okay, I see. I see what I'm paying for, and I'm going to be paying you know ten or twenty dollars for for content on it. When you price it at like seventy nine dollars, I look at that and say, I'm paying seventy nine dollars for a digital um, piece of electronics, and you're charging me how much per book or yeah. movie that's on there that costs Amazon zero dollars? Obviously, someone had to pay a lot of money. Well, to make licensing, it, but, yeah, there's licensing right, fees. Yeah. How much money did it take to develop and research and produce the Kindle? I mean, look at a movie or a book, right? I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm not. You know, trying to say that the content is not valuable, that people writing books are, shouldn't be compensated because I absolutely I love I love reading a good book and watch a good movie, but the problem is when you put a price point of like seventy nine dollars on the Kindle, which is then trying to sell you ten dollar and twenty dollar yeah. digital items, yeah. and it's like, are you telling me that this this digital item took one fifth as much work to make as this entire Kindle yeah, line? I'm funny. not sure people quite have that value proposition differently yet because people still look at technology as new, flashy, and expensive. And I think it might have been actually better for Amazon to say it's $0 because then they're not putting a comparative price on it, right? That's why they want to get to $0 because they can say, yeah, it's expensive, but we're giving it to you for free. Whereas if they put it at $79, people are thinking they're making money at $79 and then charging me, you know, what's an audiobook cost now? Like yeah, 20 bucks still? Yeah. It's like ridiculous. Audiobooks... But but you know what? It, it might have been better in uh, suited for them to do it. Um, basically, just uh, do an Amazon Prime deal. So for seventy, because that's what their price is per year, right? Seventy nine dollars for Amazon Prime, um, and you get the Kindle with it, right? Yeah. So I, I think that the, what it, whatever they're doing, uh, they're showing you the small, medium, and large piece. Now now they've got these products, and none of them are more than one hundred ninety nine dollars. And uh, and it opens them up for I think in the, in the spring of 2012 to launch a, a full size tablet, a, you know, a really immersive experience. Now I'll, I'll tell you one thing: we're I'm a big fan of Jeff Bezos. I've often said that Amazon is going to be the largest company on the planet at some point, and Bezos is actually going to be president of the world, maybe president of the universe now. 
Uh, but there's some stumbling blocks here, and one of those big things is the um, is the thing that that a lot of companies are trying to figure out, which is that d divide between the device to the home entertainment system to the television set. And as kludgy as it may be, Apple still has this with Apple TV, where I'm watching, you know, I'm watching it on my device, and I can flick it to my TV. And and uh, I think that that's where there's a big gap. I've often said that. You know the distance between you and your television set is, you know, is maybe four feet, but you know the big crevice that you have to go through, it, it's so deep and so complicated to bridge that gap. So that's that's uh, that's the big challenge I think for Amazon is to is you know once you're in the home, once I'm getting video, once I'm getting audio streamed to this device, how do I get this onto my television or a bigger screen? And I think that that's a gap that they're still suffering through. That's, yeah, I think that Amazon's. Amazon's challenge now that they're firmly planted in the tablet space and, and setting a corporate path towards this being a major direction for the company. It's like, okay, we're now we're launching physical goods back in the day, not just books, other goods. Major direction change for the company to yep. expand. This is another major direction change. And they're going to have to see if they can overcome something that Apple's had trouble overcoming, which is there's an uh, article on Mac Rumors. Uh, that was today, which was talking really about Apple discontinuing the iPod Classic and iPod Shuffle. But th the interesting part of it was a graph that was on there about sales by quarter and, and kind of breaking down where the revenue is coming from in Apple. And you can see, you know, the iPhone graph, like the iPhone hardware graph going like this as they sell more iPhones and then the iPad kind of getting on there and going like this at the top. But what you see is the iTunes revenue actually not growing like that. It stays, you know, relatively consistent across time. And, you know, there's pricing model changes that have happened that have, that have changed, you know, selling more content but a lower price, things like that. But the, the point is that even now, the revenue that Apple makes off of iTunes is dwarfed by their hardware sales. Yeah. So Amazon is coming in saying, no, no, we make money off of content sales. Yeah. So are they going to be able to you know, flip that around and say, okay, the revenue from our hardware sales is here, but our content sales is here. That's going to be a big challenge for them. Well, I mean, that's what they've sold. All they've done is content sales, right? So um, they're subsidizing, they're subsidizing the, uh, the hardware in order to be able to get them into that content stream. I don't know which side I'd rather be on, quite frankly. Um, well, I do, actually, because uh, I look at, at the, the trials and tribulations of this competitive space in hardware and... Uh, you know, hardware can be lucrative when it's done right, um, but it's also a crutch. So you end up thinking too much about the hardware. And, and uh, I mean, RIM didn't move on anything because the fact of their 80% reliance on hardware revenue. Um, so it, it kind of, it stalled their growth. Um, or it started, it's not their growth, their opportunities. And so, you know, can, uh, can Amazon win this because they've come in from a content first perspective? Well, look what they've done. I mean, they're the curators of the Earth's, con uh, you know, digital products. It's um, it's pretty impressive what they've done. And and uh, but again, this is not. It's two different experiences, as you said. It's not an iPad killer. It's not an iPad replacement yet. Um, but I would seriously, you know, I would consider this I, if they had two things. One is that if uh, if I couldn't get the same services on some other iPad, like I've already got it, or other a tablet, I've got an iPad. And if they bridge that gap between my home or my small device and a large screen, because I think those are the challenges. But they also announced today, as part of uh, the fire, this thing called Silk, which uh, you, you, you put it so succinctly in, in, a, uh, in a Twitter post earlier this morning that said basically, <laughs> uh, hello, Rim. Like, they're not the first company to do something like this, but Silk is basically a cloud-based um, uh, browser that does everything up in the cloud, does all the heavy lifting on the cloud, all the caching in the cloud, and obviously Amazon Web Services, AWS, and and then uh, basically your device is a dumb display, right? Well, more more than that, it it selectively helps to choose yes. what your device does from a power standpoint to display and what is done in the cloud. Yep. So uh, they had a great you know two three four minute video or whatever it was on explaining how their stuff worked and made complete sense. And it's it's everything they're doing isn't unique, but the whole package together and tying it to the cloud is. Yeah. So, you know, RIM has released uh, browser technology and done browser technology for a number of years that have optimized the pages sent down to the BlackBerry 
for a while, that was a big strength of theirs because you could load pages way faster on BlackBerry than any other device for many years. And then it became a hindrance because part of that was changing the way a web page looked to make it look better on a mobile device, and people switched over to thinking they wanted to look like a desktop experience. But looking like a desktop experience takes power to run, whether it's JavaScript or DHTML or Flash or whatever happens to be on there. Uh, you really need a powerful device to be able to render that. And so the devices haven't really kept up with the power needed to render web pages quickly on mobile devices. So Amazon is taking a great tack with this. It's kind of saying, okay, we're going to do a little bit of both. We are going to pre-process stuff in the cloud behind the scenes and cache stuff and pre pre-cache pages that we think you're going to want to access. But we're also going to leverage the fact that there is work that can be done on the mobile device as well. So we're not going to render your image for you, but we'll know that, as they use the example, a three megabyte image might look the same as a 50 kilobyte image on your screen because you just don't have the resolution to display a high res image anyways. And so, you know, RIM, RIM did this, and one, one problem that I always found with some of these solutions is that, okay, yeah, you don't get the three megabyte image, but then when you want to view the image, you have to go download the three megabyte image. And so there is some um, trade-offs there in terms of, yes, you're getting a faster display of content, and some of your content is downsized, but still looks okay when you're looking like that. But as soon as you zoom in, now you're using a different resolution on it. So it'll be interesting to see how they accommodate you know, people's behaviors of, okay, as soon as you just flip the device around, or you zoom in on the screen, or whatever it happens to be, that um, it still looks good, it still has rendered fast, it doesn't have to kind of go re reget the page. But overall... Really interesting technology, um, really uh, thoughtful way of doing it, I think. And, and you know, as I said, when I, when I saw the video, I just went, if, if I was somebody at RIM, I would just be like, What do we do? Yeah. Don't, don't. Like, it's the total, the total Homer Simpson. Don't, don't. Like, I should have thought of that before. But, you know, it's funny because uh, we were talking before we, went, we started recording is that uh, is RIM the new uh, kind of Xerox park, right? Where they've, they've, uh, they've pioneered some of this technology like email on the hip. And uh, and been surpassed, and and uh, certainly SMS and uh, and closed loop private uh, SMS like you know BlackBerry uh, BBM. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, this is a, a massive trend, and Apple's and you know about to release their own version in iOS five, and uh, and there's a whole bunch of other companies that are out there doing doing this today. And then uh, the other thing is that the way they handle the browser now, they focus exclusively on the technology, which was to reduce bandwidth consumption. Because I remember Mike L talking about bandwidth consumption he said you know uh unlimited access to bandwidth is a bad thing he said that it's a bad thing and uh so they focused on streamlining the the data consumption piece and uh without a real vision to think that maybe at some point data consumption uh would be next to free right with wi-fi ubiquitous wi-fi um a, a, as a minimum and I'm not talking about 3G or 4G networks. Just the access to bandwidth right now is is everywhere. Uh, it's kind of limiting. Um, but when you start to think about these things, it's uh, they, they focused on this and they had the technology. It's through the Bez server uh, technology, but they um, they were looking at it from uh, an optimization piece um, to constrain bandwidth, not to do all the heavy lifting and the inference. Great example in that video was, you know, if if everybody comes to the New York Times or whatever was the New York Times web, uh, website through, through your mobile device and 93% of them click on the arts or the business section, then they'll preload the, the pre-cache it and, and bring that in ahead of time so that you're not consuming bandwidth and they'll display. So it's about speed on the device and, and that kind of stuff. That's pretty cool. I, I, I like this and uh, I like it because it's optimized mobile. And the thing that resonated with, with me right away and we'll talk about this at some of the things that I saw at Gigom mobilize, was that they said, why are people following the same paradigm of web browsing technology? What should they be? And so they threw all that out and they said, what should the experience be on a mobile device? And then they started from the ground up and that kind of goes into uh, you, you know some of the other conversations that we're gonna have. That's what really resonated with me. That's why Amazon's gonna, uh, gonna be the biggest company uh, on the planet. And that's, it's a common, over the last, I guess, we've been doing this for nine months now, um, there's been numerous times where we've said, wow, this was a really good idea, because what they did was say, forget about what people are doing now, forget about what you are doing now, let's think about if we had to throw out all the legacy stuff yeah. and build it, what we would want now, what would we build? Yeah. And, you know, mobile payments and, and, and the mobile wallet thing is in that same vein as when we talked about Visa's uh, vision that they did a nice video for as well, as they 
said, forget about what's happened in the past. What would we actually want if we could build it? And Amazon is doing the same thing. Forget about how browsers were built before. You know, what do we need to solve? What are the actual problems on mobile devices? Let's build a browser that solves mobile device problems, not solves desktop problems, and then kind of squish it into a into a mobile form factor. Yeah, that, that's a great point. Is that uh, you know, uh, and, and we're guilty about this. And, and you can you can start to bring this down to to every level. You know, when when we're building mobile experiences, but. Uh, you know, a mobile website. We talk about a mobile optimized website, and uh, you know, I've always had a challenge with calling it a website uh, because it's it, it's uh, it has these kind of connotations of of the the true web. At least in North America, the true web is a big screen. You know, uh, high bandwidth. Um, doesn't matter. Uh, you know, about consumption. But uh, but what if Amazon's uh, services are smart enough, or somebody's services are smart enough? So I don't need to build that mobile uh, optimized experience that does it for me. And I'm not talking about services that you, you basically push your website in and it comes out with an optimized service. It's just that um, it, it's it it, uh, it it infers a little bit better. There's a massive amount of data, and I think Google's the right company to do this, where it just says, listen. You know, this is we've cached the internet, and and this is what it looks like from a mobile optimized experience, not the web, but this is just a mobile optimized experience based on the time of day, the, your location, the weather, and what you've put in there. Uh, you know that in the search term, this is this is uh, this is all the data we can find in in a great way. We got to stop thinking about uh, how we've done things. And it's, and that and not on that vein, it's interesting because over the last two, three years, I would have told people, look, you need to build a mobile website. Like, if you're going to go on access with people on mobile, you need to decide what features you want on mobile and bring your bring your website to mobile and have a mobile version of your site. It's not your main version of your site. It's something different. But over now, kind of towards the end of 2011 and looking forward to 2012 and, and beyond, I think that my opinion on that is shifting a bit, in which is that there was some quote, I forget which article I was reading today, that said, yeah, there is no mobile web. It's just the web. Mm -hmm. And that's not totally true today, but within a couple of years, yeah, that's right. There isn't. It's not the mobile web and desktop web. It's the web. Just consider a mobile web like when you had to build for Internet Explorer and Netscape yeah. as two completely different websites because you had to build the technology different. It's the same for the mobile website that's going to happen right now. Amazon isn't solving your display and functionality problem. They're just solving the speed of rendering issue. On websites, so it doesn't mean that you can just build your main website and go. Oh, people can use it on mobile now. No, no, you still have to build a site that works across all the browsers that are accessing it. And as you see the percentage of mobile browsers hitting your site go up, you need to build interfaces for the same content that works on an iPad using a touch uh, touch screen that works on an iPhone. If you're seeing a lot of people in there on a Playbook or an Amazon tablet yeah. or whatever device you happen to be there, and it's it's. It's kind of all in one, and, and I think that as we build out more you know, HTML5 applications, which you're seeing some really good examples now, people of using HTML5 to target tablets and desktop websites as well, is that you need to build a website that you can provide the same functionality on. It's just it's just a different view of it, and still accommodate the fact that you have some of these legacy users on other devices, but you still need to build you know separate sites. Well. I think we've beaten this one to death, um, and, and you know it's a good segue because uh, I want to actually uh, bring up. We're going to talk about what GigaOM uh, Mobilize was uh, for me, my perspective. I'll, I'll do a short rundown. There's some great conversation topics, and I'm pretty sure that we're going to have to take a lot of these online, but be, offline or, or into future episodes. Um, but before we do that, uh, I had a great opportunity to uh, to hook up with uh, Matt Hatley, who is the uh, the uh, uh, GM of um, um, Macadamian's California office down here, and uh, if you don't know Macadamian, they're one of the sponsors of the show, and and we really appreciate the fact that they do this uh, each and every episode, as well as the the sponsorship of Untethered TV. And but uh, what these guys do is they they build great experiences, uh, whether it's a mobile experience or you know you've got a challenge with some hardware that you want to put a, a UI on. These guys are experts at doing this. They they take your ideas, they take what's in here, and jam it either onto this. Or onto this, or onto the desktop, or they create interfaces that are just usable, beautiful, uh, functional, fluid. Um, they just bring your ideas to life when it comes to um, in the digital realm. And uh, every opportunity I get to hang uh, out and visit with uh, with Matt down here is great. 
Uh, but these guys just make apps and make mobile experience sing. And we really appreciate the fact that they are sponsoring Untether.tv and this podcast, Two Guys on Mobile. We love them. Go and check them out at macadamian.com. And they, I said, you know, I met, um, I met Matt down in, uh, at uh, GigaOM, Mobilize. And I'll tell you, I, I don't know if you were following any of these, uh, any of the Twitter sphere uh, around what was going on down there, but... There was a uh, there was a, a, a considerable amount of activity, and I think that Om Malik and his team, uh, you know Kevin uh, Kevin Tofel, um, who who is the MC of this, he's also a senior uh, gigom writer. I think uh, I mean he's the J, uh, Jake Handler run the mobile guy, um, as well as uh, a few of, of, of other of his uh, of his folks. They did just just such a great job of putting something like this together. Uh, particularly, uh, as I said, Kevin uh, Om. And uh, Ryan Kim, who's a, a writer at uh, GigOM as well. Um, but holy cow, t- talk about two days, Jeff, of just, you know, there's never enough conversation, I think, in mobile. But by the end of the two days, I, I was like, wow, there's so much going on. I can't take it. My brain is going to explode. Um, so I, I, did you follow much of this that was going on there? Uh, I, I tried to follow some of it, and I was scanning over. There was usually like... You know, 500 word summaries of different talks that were going on that I would that I would scan through, and some of them sounded interesting, and some of them sounded, well, not not quite interesting. As interesting or uh, as relevant as you would think. But I'm sure sitting there and trying to listen to panelist after panelist after panelist or sitting down, it was uh, quite be quite an experience. What well, it was it was it, you know one one of the great things is that the lineup here is always great. You know, I, I don't think we could get this kind of lineup here. I mean, we had. Uh, you know, you know, reps from every major company uh, that were either moving into mobile or are in mobile. Um, and so a, a few observations. One of them is that this industry is confusing. This industry is, is under massive, consistent change and shift and turmoil. We all know that. And that's really where the bright spark of entrepreneurship really does come through, right? This is, this is uh, formation years. Picture it like a bunch of gas. And uh, you know we're waiting for it to actually form the planet, and that's that's really where we are when it comes to to, to mobile, and it, it's pretty obvious. Uh, so at this kind of spot where entrepreneurship and money meet, and ideation, and uh, and a new technology or newer technology, and mass consumer adoption, mass enterprise adoption, it's like a cluster of absolute mayhem and ideas. So everybody's speculating, and. Um, and that was the big observation is that <clears throat> we also tend, I, I saw this quite a bit, we tend to overcomplicate things right off the get-go. Uh, and we tend to put our bias out to the consumer. So a lot of, a lot of panelists that we were talking to or that I was listening to were, were uh, speculating or assuming a lot uh, about, uh, about their audience. And I know there's a lot of research that's out there, but... Um, but you know, there's a reason why it's been the year of mobile for the last 10 years. There's a reason why they call 2011 the year of mobile commerce and mobile payments in NFC, and that's not going to happen for three or four years. It's it's just over uh, zealousness to get this stuff out, and I'm guilty of it as well because I love mobile, as do you. But it is a uh, you, so the first observation is that there is just mass confusion. Um, mass confusion and I don't think that should be a surprise to anybody but if you were there and you were thinking okay I'm gonna go there and I'm gonna figure out how to bring mobile into my company you you didn't get that you went there thinking I'm gonna wait two years until they sort their shit out and then I'm gonna come back and uh, and start bring, and start bringing this in um, so that's first observation it's not this isn't earth-shattering right um, and uh, the second thing was the, the amount of conversation that we had on things like mobile commerce, mobile payments, and, uh, and they had every uh, rep from, you know, whether it was uh, Visa or PayPal or Square or, you know, the back end processing or the enablement guys, uh, huge conversation around mobile payments and mobile commerce. Obviously, it's a topic that resonates with, uh, with everybody. Um, you know, I, I don't think that's a surprise, Jeff. No, it's it's not. I mean, mobile payments is something we've been talking about, and we know everybody is talking about. And lots of companies are, as we know, whether it's um, an ISIS solution uh, with carriers, whether it's you know Visa trying to go at their mobile wallet, Google trying to go at the mobile wallet, Apple trying to go at the mobile <laughs> wallet, being iTunes. Yep. You know, everybody is trying to find a solution to this mobile payments. Uh, I won't say it's a problem because 
there's not yet a demand. Nope. So you don't have a problem until you have enough demand for it. Right now, it's people looking for solutions to what they expect to be problems and expect to be behavior changes that people are going to request, but not, not next year. Those doesn't happen that fast. It can take a couple of years for it. So, Although I did, for the first time, I used my, my Visa card has these little like symbols like this on it. I was like, I don't know what those are for. And then I saw those same symbols at a cache somewhere. I'm like, I just touched it to it. I'm like, oh, it works. RFID like that. And yep. then I signed for it. I'm like, you know what? That's way simpler than sticking the friggin' pin chip in and typing your pin and waiting five minutes for it to do all this thing. I'd rather sign the piece of paper and use that NFC or RF, RFID chip yeah. that's in the card. So yeah, it's pay pass, tap to pay, and 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 that's exactly. really you, you know where where Mastercard is working with a lot of these companies to be able to do this because they have a, I think they have a hundred and fifty thousand of these um, uh, NFC enabled pay pass systems in the U.S. It's a small percentage, uh, but uh, but that's you know those are that's the that's the technology that's advancing. So, you know, uh, mobile pa- mobile commerce, mobile payments. It's so, it's so great, but um, the thing is that when you can do that already with a credit card, there's got to be a tremendous amount of value. Uh, and that was one of the conversations that I had with a bunch of people as well. But uh, we're going to come back to that. Observation number one is that uh, this is, uh, you know, uh, basically swirling gases. That's what the industry is, and we're tr- still trying to figure out and figure out how to how to actually uh, bring mobile in and w- what resonates. Second thing is that we we um, and, and in that we overcomplicate the next steps, and I think that that's why we're just big thinkers, right? Mobile is a big thinking space. Um, and everybody that you talk to goes down a rat hole. It's like, can you imagine? Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god! And it's like, uh, you know, I don't even have to order my groceries anymore. It's the, it is the fridge, the you know, the internet connected fridge. So we we complicate things. And and a story on that is that VMware. I remember hearing about this a couple of years back when I ran Rove, which was a uh, VMware wanted to uh, add a virtualization layer onto uh, a smartphone so that you could have two personas on the smartphone. One of them was you know, your work persona where IT could just push that uh, VM down to your, your Android device. This is only Android, obviously. Um, and, uh, and then while you're at work, this is your work persona. It has your, it, it's basically a, a virtual or a software SIM. So you get your, your VoIP and, and your email. And then when you leave your office, it goes back, you know, it's bring your own device. It goes back to your personal device. And uh, the way he explained it, uh, everybody in the room was just like, huh? What do you, huh? And it made sense, but he said, when, when a speaker up on the stage says, um, okay, I'm about to blow your mind, or I'm about to confuse you even more. Like, so I, we make that's these- warning compl- bells that go off when you oh, hear yeah. that. Like, uh-oh. When I looked around, I'm like, I don't think that's possible, man. I don't think that's possible. Um, when you know the typewriters stop, or the, the keyboards stop clacking, because everybody's trying to figure out how to write that, it's uh, so uh, that's the, the first observation. Second observation is mobile commerce, mobile payments, obviously big trends, and uh, there's a big play here. The third thing uh, and the last uh, thing that I saw um, was this massive uh, consumer consumerization of IT that is going on. And, uh, you know, big panels around how IT was going to change to accommodate the mobile world and, uh, and loosening the, the, uh, the tight ropes, reins they have over the devices that they're bringing you know, everybody talked about BYOD, bring your own device, um, and the need for IT to become a service, uh, that service layer, not the guys who say no to everything that you ask for. And um, so, you, you know, those those were big, those were the big, big rocks that I saw at, uh, at this thing. And, you, you know, from those, there, there stems, you know, probably two dozen stories around uh, companies that were doing things right, companies that uh, were doing things wrong, and some, some other announcements. But those were the big rocks. I, I, again, these should, this should not be uh, surprising to anybody. It wasn't to me. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that, those are my quick observations. I'm going to sit down with Kevin Toffel uh, uh, from GigOM uh, later this week to do a session on uh, a little bit more in depth about uh, you know, his takeaways. Uh, from from this event and to try to figure out uh, you know to try to impart you know the big lessons learned so look for that coming soon or if you're watching this later in in the future it's already there That's go cool. find it go find it uh, yeah so nothing 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 massive um, uh, you know some announcements came out of this uh, some big ones that uh, Instagram hit 10 million users um, you know sprint got up on stay sprint 
uh, yeah, I mean, it was there were some big advertisements, uh, you know, announcing smartphones. But again, I don't I don't care about the smartphone. I just care about the experience. Um, but Instagram announced uh, they had uh, they had uh, Kevin Systrom, who's the CEO of Instagram, and he was talking about uh, about the massive growth that they've gone into and uh, 10 million users, and that's a that's a growth curve. Like I've never like we talked about it what uh, 60 days ago, and they were at 3 million. So uh, they're almost as uh, they're almost as big, and they're on a on a greater growth curve than Foursquare, and that's something that is astounding. Um, they're doing a lot right. And uh, and you know it was it was a great conversation and um, so there, there was a lot of that but really the big observations was that it's a massive gas and I mean that literally um, this, and uh, we confuse things con the uh, mobile payment mobile commerce and uh, consumerization of IT was anybody when they were talking about their big picture issues like mobile payments yeah did you hear people trying to think that they were going to come up with the solution to solve everything or did you hear people talking about more that we need to find a common ground solution or to to roll out because you can't you can't roll out a solution to one tenth of the people that are out yeah. there because it's not I mean, you need critical mass you need everybody to be on board you need mastercard and visa need the same solution basically because merchants aren't going to want to buy two different point of purchase systems just to support mastercard and visa and discover and something like that right so was there a lot of talk about People figuring that Square was trying to, this goal was to be the one, and that everybody would then start using Square Tech, or that they were trying to partner up with enough companies so that you could get one or two standards that were put in place. Uh, well, this is a, this is a race, right? Like th that's what everybody's thinking is that this is a race we want to dominate. So that's why Google Wallet. I'm in San Francisco. It's it's not everywhere, but it's prominent. Um, and uh, ISIS made the announcement this week about uh, you know all their partnerships and uh, and PayPal a couple of weeks ago made their announcement about th their mobile uh, mobile commerce and mobile payment systems and and uh, you know there really is a uh, a massive challenge around around this kind of stuff and um, and Square uh, came out and said that you know NFC which was everybody was talking about is this the year of NFC um, and what what Square came out and said was basically. Uh, NFC means not for commerce, right? That NFC, there's no demand for it. There's no uh, there's no interest from uh, from the merchant side because you got to take into consideration the merchant's ability to uh, pay for this and integrate NFC and understand it in the training. And this is a massive uh, shift. So uh, you know that this is make no this is a war. Like this is a mobile payment, mobile commerce war, and there's a lot of money at stake. And uh, it's not just about the transaction piece, it's about the uh, before transaction, during transaction, and after transaction ownership of the customer. And that's what people are battling for. And, you know, I asked a question uh, on a panel uh, that was, uh, it, was a, it was actually a very good panel. It was, uh, if I can find the actual uh, conversation um, as I'm looking through this very quickly. This was a uh, it was a panel around uh, mobile payments 2012. Will this be the year? And it was it was uh, it was uh, the uh, the moderator was uh, Karen Webster. She is the CEO of uh, Market Platform Dynamics, and and she, she was awesome. She was just you know to the punch. She was she didn't placate anybody. And on the panel was uh, somebody from PayPal, somebody from Visa, somebody from Intuit, and somebody from Verifone. So it was a great combination. You know, from a carrier enabler to a uh, you know a, a, a financial institution to uh, PayPal and, and then Visa, and uh, I'll tell you who I was impressed with, which was Laura Laura Chambers, who's the senior director of uh, PayPal Mobile. Uh, she was awesome. Uh, her perspective on on mobile payments and uh, and the like was uh, exactly what you'd want in a in a company like this. Visa was very institutionalized. It was like this is what Visa said, and I'm not lying. You can check out the video. They said, "Well, we're giving our merchants till 2015 to get get to get on this mobile payment uh, NFC chip piece." Right now, liability lands with the banks. Right, so if somebody walks into your store and uses a, a credit card that is uh, that is stolen or is a fraudulent credit card, uh, liability is with the banks. By t uh, by 2015. If you haven't switched over to their new system with NFC and all this kind of stuff and mobile payments for Visa, liability lands on you, you, the retailer. 
Like they just like they're bullying this through, and and that is not the approach. And then uh, Laura spoke, and I asked that question. I, this was part of the question that I asked, and she said, "I said, you know, how do you get consumers engaged? Because that's what it's got to be." And she said, "Look, at PayPal, we have invited people in to go through their wallets to understand what they have in there, why they use what they use, what their expert their experience should be." And and they, she said, literally, people are freaks about their wallets. So we wanted to understand what was in people's wallets. So they did a sampling of people's wallets and understood how they use it. And they said, based on that, this is how we're going to roll it out, which is the before purchase, during purchase, and after purchase. And it was absolutely refreshing. Whether they have the right system, they make it easy. There's no friction. There's no hardware, software bullshit that you have to get through from a merchant. Uh, I don't know if there's a long-term viable strategy that they're doing. But the difference between PayPal and Visa was obvious, is that one was a bully, the other one wanted to work with the consumers and the merchants. And that, that was astounding. So I don't even know if that answered your question. But uh, coincidentally, one of them is the incumbent and one of them is trying to break in as well. Yeah. So That's right. The, this is disruption the incumbent happening. Has the, the incumbent has the advantage of being able to say, yeah, you want to take Visa cards? Which you do. Yeah. Here's our new conditions. Yeah. Take it or leave it. And they're going to be taking it. So. I, I'm not, to be honest, in order to push forward the agenda of mobile payments on people faster, yeah. sometimes you need the institutionalized way of doing things to say, look, if I have to put this rock over your head to force you to uh, move forward from a merchant perspective to, to accept these, these payment systems, I'll do it because I know it'll be better for the consumers in the end. Yeah. And it, the hard part with mobile payments is figuring out what in the end is actually going to be the best solution for our customers to use? Because sometimes we think, well, we'll just put all of our cards on a, on one card or something. And but maybe that's not the most convenient solution for people. Maybe it's not using your phone to pay for something. Maybe it is still having a wallet, but that things are just in, in less pieces or or something. Like whatever the solution is going to be, we may or may not be able to figure it out now what people are actually going to accept when they start using these en masse. Yep. So, like, right, even right now, even the friggin' chip cards thing. I know. Everybody's, I, I, you see people all the time hand the card to the teller, and the teller puts in the chip thing or says, go put it in the chip thing. So, you know, chips aren't, you know, 10 years old, but they're not six months old either. Yeah. So, if it's taking this long to get that process in place, to me, that is showing the chip thing is not a consumer benefit aside from security. It's actually a detriment. People are very used to swiping through, not having to put it in and type a pin for their credit card. Yeah. And so when you try and change that behavior, it takes a long time. So maybe the solution for mobile is going to have to be back to like, okay, it's a mobile payment, but it's swipe or click or whatever, and you're done, and you still sign yeah. or whatever. Right now, I mean, or technically, a pin or something. Well, the problem with a pin is it's an extra data transfer step, right? Yeah. Whether it's on your phone, you have to wait for the signal back and forth. Whether it's on a pin pad, you have to wait for say authorizing, get into your pin, verifying pin. Like, it takes a long time. It takes longer to do the pin thing than it does to swipe the card. Yep. It takes longer for a new technology than the old technology. And to me, it's way more convenient to swipe my card than it is to use the pin. Yep. So I'll avoid it. If I have the option, I'm going to swipe my card. But, but that's, the bank would, and Visa wants me to use the, uh, the chip. But that's what you're, that's what you're up against. Um, and it's, uh, you know, I, well, maybe, maybe Visa can come in and be a bully, but MasterCard has their own system. ISIS is going to be its own. And then Google Wallet's going to be its own. And, and when you what you start to see is, like, you know, swipe is one thing. But when, you know, swipe, stripe in, swipe, stripe out, different vendors, different systems, it's, it's all, like, what we've got here is, uh, is just, um, you know, a... It's got to be much more seamless to the consumer than what we're seeing, and and uh, it's got to be much more what the consumer wants. It's part of their life. It's like how do you get them to do this without changing their behaviors? And that's the difference here is that maybe Visa can it has the clout to to force it on you. But what I like about what uh, at least Laura's approach from PayPal is that she's she's like, listen, what we want to do is we want to basically we want to extend the way you do it without any pain without any uh, you know learning curve and we don't want to we don't want to have to we want to do it today so we don't have to actually make sure that the, all the merchants are on we want it, we want every merchant in the world to be able to accept this today just like cash but yeah. like I'll tell you it was uh, you could tell that maybe next year it's going to be it'll be clearer 
right? We're going to get some results from what what Google's doing with their Google Wallet and acceptance, and uh, you know, Amazon is is kicking ass when it comes to mobile payments, um, and uh, I, th I think we're just we're just lacking a little bit of data on this stuff as to how the consumers are really going to use this and to, to their value. But it's not about payment; it's about adding value before the transaction, during the transaction, and after the transaction. And that's what that's the the puzzle that's missing. It's not replacing cash; it's enhancing an experience and adding value to all of the consumer, the retailer, and the bank slash credit yeah. card company. So I mean, I could I could probably spend two days talking about. Uh, um, Mobilize because there was a lot there, but I, I would implore you. I've done a couple of videos up on Untether.tv. Go and check them out. Uh, a couple of observations. I'll do another one today. Um, and uh, when I when I get with uh, Kevin, I will uh, I'll post that. It'll be uh, it'll be a quick turnaround this week as well. So uh, just take a look at that, and you'll get his perspective uh, and observations, which are uh, which obviously he's in, he's in the middle of it and uh, and working at the gig ohm on on the mobile side. So. I, I, you know, I, I'd loathe to go into any more detail, but needless to say, uh, Om Malik and his team did a uh, did a, an incredible job um, of balancing, uh, you know, an event like this with kind of you put somebody from Facebook in a senior executive from Facebook, they're not going to tell you anything, right? Like, so that's the big challenge: is that putting somebody on Facebook is like 40 minutes of wasted time because they're not they're going to tell you the corporate line they're not going to tell you anything of any relevance they're going to tell you what you, what uh, what they want to tell you uh, from a PR standpoint so you have to do that but it was a good balance of, uh, of great conversation and um, funny enough there was maybe 380 or 400 people that attended 155 of them have gone through on tether.tv as an interview it's pretty cool good reach so that was uh, Giga Mobilize. Unless you have anything else to add to this, is that? Uh... <laughs> I think that's. I think that's good for this. Uh, uh, for this coverage of Mobilize. Yeah. Now. Well, before we we uh, reach our, our uh, short last segment, I uh, I you know I had a great opportunity uh, uh, to sit through uh, Scott Schwartzoff, who's the VP of Marketing and uh, and Developer Relations for a company called Accelerator. You may have heard these guys. Uh, they allow you to create cross-platform mobile, uh, cross-platform applications. That's across all mobile applications onto the desktop, and uh, and I, I sat through a, a really great session that Scott did on mobile strategy. And uh, you know, it was so out of the ordinary at, at this event because everybody was focused on pushing a platform like Twilio or or uh, you know IP practices and managing your brand. But what Scott did was, which was great, he pulled back and, and he talked about mobile strategy, and that's why I am a big fan of Accelerator, and that's why I'm so happy that they're sponsoring uh, two guys on mobile and on Tether TV. Um, and uh, it was just a unique, a unique session. If you haven't taken a look at Accelerator, uh, you know they have a, a ton of uh, applications out there. They were featuring the NBC app, so they did a Jay Leno um, uh, application, which was done on Accelerator's platform. A titanium and then they did a Jimmy Fallon uh, app and then they did the full NBC blown out so if you download the NBC app from app uh, from the App Store for the iPad that is an accelerator app and the reason they chose them was because uh, it's it's on every platform uh, it's in multiple languages it's uh, it's it, it can be on the desktop application if they so cr chose to do it and it's done all in, in native uh, uh, native language it, it's a it's a stellar uh, piece of technology and uh, they are probably the leading uh, company in this space right now. So I, I implore you, go check them out, appcelerator.com. It was great to actually meet Scott in person. I've done a couple of interviews with him. He's a great guy. Smart guy. Smart team. Appcelerator.com. Thanks, guys. All right. Our last segment, we're going to limit this. And let's talk about um, the reasons to go mobile. The reasons to go mobile. I don't even know how to describe this. Uh, other than, uh, you know, I've been very critical of car apps and these kind of companies that are building one-off, low uh, regency, low reason to return apps. Um, is that a good way to describe this? Yeah, I mean, the, it's that, that's that's certainly something that you have talked about many times before. We we've talked about, which is the you know how the frequency of use of a mobile app and and how, using that information to help you decide whether or not a mobile app is actually right 
for what you should build or whether you should just build a mobile website yep. um, or, or whatever you need to do. Like why the reasons for going mobile need to be clear. There needs to be a strategy behind it. And it can be a long-term strategy, of course, as well. You can you can chalk up the cost of, of developing it to a longer-term mobile strategy that may not be as clear as when you first put the app on the market. But, you know, sometimes... Like a five-year plan. Well, the problem with a five-year plan in mobile is that there's no such thing as a five-year plan in no. mobile. So if, you're, if your plan hasn't come to fruition in, in two years, then, you know, that was not the right plan, <laughs> generally. So, but I think it came up uh, um, recently just when thinking about uh, what Facebook talked about after their F8 conference and what Twitter, um, I forget when they were talking about it in terms of um, their mobile usage, but both companies said basically half their usage is, is on mobile. Yeah. So I think Twitter said they crossed the 50% mark of tweets from mobile versus desktop. And Facebook said basically half their users are, are using their mobile apps. And when you think about that, that's, that's really impressive. Those are you know, two of the most popular mobile services that are out there. But they are also applications that don't directly generate revenue for those two companies. And so if you are successfully, if they're successfully moving their users to their mobile apps, which don't have any revenue generation in them, is that a net positive for those companies? I'm not saying it's a net negative. I'm just saying it's a question that you have to ask yourself as you move people along, is that you can build up a service people really want to use and apps that people really like to use, but if you don't have a plan to monetize those in the future, you might just be moving people off the platform that you're making money on. Well, and it's, uh, I, I mean, that's a, uh, you know, with Facebook, they, they call the, the future of what they're doing, the future of Facebook is in mobile. And, uh, and certainly Twitter is, it demonstrated that, 100 million uh, active users and 50% uh, of those guys are, 50% are, of the Twitter posts are coming from a mobile device. And, uh, you know, they know that they have to go this route. Um, and, but this is, this is one of those, this is the big challenge is that it, the mobile is a disruptive a, a piece of technology or disruptive time. And how do you how do you make, make sure that the revenue doesn't disappear? Um, how do you take people off of your uh, existing service and put them on mobile and not have an impact your bottom line? And, you know, while Facebook and Twitter are big enough companies that, you know, they've got enough funding or they've got, you know, they've got backers. That's a, it's an important question to ask yourself as well. Um, you, you know, if you're going to push out mobile, does it cannibalize your existing line? Does it cannibalize your existing chain? And if it does, you have to really think about uh, how you look at mobile, not as uh, mimicking your existing service or offering, but finding new ways to bring mobile in to maybe look at new ways of generating revenue from that new way that mobile uh, can actually enable your customers to do something. And the great example of that was Twitter, you know, getting people moving to mobile and going, look, we got tons of people on mobile, so look, it's time to try and monetize this mobile platform. And this was, I think it was this year, last year. Yeah. So they, they added ads yeah. into the mobile app. They inserted them in your, into your stream where they had the pop-up when you're doing stuff. And my goodness, the backlash to that was so fierce, they had to pull them out. Yeah. So they tried to monetize it and then pulled it out. So what that tells you is that they didn't do enough research ahead of time to know what their users were going to accept from a non-monetization standpoint on mobile. And if that was their plan as to how to monetize mobile, then they kind of went, oh, that's not going to work. Now what are we going to do? And nobody would argue, be idiotic to argue that Apple integrating Twitter into the iOS is bad for Twitter. Yeah. But if it moves more people off of not only the Twitter desktop, but also the Twitter mobile app, because things are just kind of innately tweeted from other applications, where does Twitter generate its revenue from, which is all advertising based right now? Yeah. Well, I wonder, it's, it's like, um, uh, could it be, you know, Twitter, is, Twitter becomes like electricity and, uh, and companies like, like Facebook, um, the same thing. And uh, Apple pays a licensee or royalty fee to, to enable that inside of, uh, inside of their system to, to get Apple's products a little more sticky. It's, it's pretty vague. Um, but, you know, advertising for Twitter is still probably the most important thing. But relevancy, regency, and, uh, and calls to action are another piece. So maybe by Twitter being integrated right into the, to iOS, like it is on BlackBerry OS 6, um, what the value that they're bringing is that, that flow or crush of data and distilling that data based on, on those things. You know, time of day, location, weather, 
and uh, ability to target specific things to that specific user. And maybe that's where maybe that's where you're paying a premium because there's a torrent of data and distilling that data and giving you relevancy uh, is probably the most valuable piece that that mobile can offer. Aside from throwing up a, a you know a banner ad, um, which just doesn't work. Yeah, if they if they have a strategy for indirect monetization of the yeah. users, and right now when you're on the website, there's direct monetization points of interest that, that are on there, sponsored hashtags and, and sponsored uh, uh, follow suggestions and things like that. Yeah. But um, and on BlackBerry, it's not integrated into the OS. It's just no. there's a Twitter app that's included with BlackBerry, but on iOS, it's going to be integrated you know, deeply within it. Well, think about it. So, I mean, if I'm Starbucks, and I, you know, I use Starbucks because they're technically and mobily uh, um, advanced uh, as a retailer, and uh, but if you if you think about Starbucks, is that um, if if I, for example, uh, you know, uh, check into to to Starbucks, and or I have uh, I've been at Starbucks many times, and you know, I, I've identified myself at Starbucks. Uh, you you could do a proximity based search around me and leverage Twitter as a medium to push out a message for a discount on a half cap latte or a caramel macchiato or whatever it is, and um, and you know, or, or while I'm in Starbucks and I've got location services enabled and I've given all my approvals and you know, um, they can entice me to upgrade. So it's it's about getting an extra dollar. You don't know what my spend is going to be. So how can the uh, how can the iPhone and Twitter leverage each other and the location to give Starbucks that extra boost? So if my spend is going to be typically two dollars for a tall you know dark roast. Um, can you, while I'm a in the line, actually convince me or coerce me to spend an extra dollar or two dollars on a caramel macchiato because I'm there? And maybe that's where this monetization, where that's where the value comes in, is Twitter being the, uh, you know, as uh, Leo Laporte calls it, the nervous system. And now it's just, it's basically, um, you know, a, a much more uh, aware uh, piece of technology rather than having to physically check into a service and using Foursquare. Uh, I mean, that's an example of maybe maybe a way that th these guys can actually work very closely together. I'm assuming they've got a plan. Don't you? Because because all companies started in California that are have a goal of growing users have plans to monetize those users in the future. That's, that's now I'm not saying standard, that standard practice. Uh, I'm saying that you know. Yeah, I don't know what I'm saying. I, I mean, I, I'm jaded because I, I'm a revenue guy. I love revenue. And uh, if you're not generating revenue, if you don't have a thought about revenue from the beginning, I don't care if it's like an inkling of a thought, like it's just a tiny little thought. If you don't have a single thought about revenue, like I, I get nervous and I'm not even involved in your company. So th that's that's my, my thing. But, you know, um, it, it's very, it's, I don't know if that Twitter has a revenue model, so this might be just a natural extension to not making money for them. But uh, there's no doubt that there are power horses in this space, and Facebook is one of them. And when they get into mobile, they're going to get into it. Um, and uh, the same thing with Twitter. And, uh, you know, the dominant brands are iOS and Android, and being a part of those two, you need, just need to be there and then let the chips fall where they may. Um, and uh, and hopefully at the end of it all, which is, you know, there's a clear path to revenue. It's not the right, it's not the best way to do it. Um, but, uh, and I don't condone that, but I don't think anybody would turn it down. It's like getting shelf space at Walmart. Um, it's, it's one of the greatest things possibly that you could do for your company for uh, total distribution, but it's probably one of the most taxing and it can kill you, right? So, um, I, I don't have an answer to this, Jeff. <laughs> I don't think it's an answerable question, but I think it's something that we need. Everybody, when they're when they're going mobile, which we, that term needs to disappear because yeah. if you're in business now and you and you don't have any mobile presence or you haven't thought about it, then then you're probably screwed anyways. But yeah, exactly. Um, but as as you're moving and uh, dealing with mobile users, that just going mobile or just having a mobile point of presence itself isn't necessarily a net positive on, on your company, aside from halo effect and, and marketing. And you, you can write a certain amount of stuff off like that, but from a functional direct revenue generating perspective, if you think mobile is there to support your business from a direct revenue generating perspective, you better have a damn good uh, way to monetize those users and a backup plan for when you try and put monetization in and they have a backlash on you. Yep. 
Well, it, it, it's good. It's caveat, right? So it's something to think about. So go and think about this. And if you're you're out there on Twitter, it's and trying to figure out how to monetize that. Um, I, I'm we'll be watching this eagerly as Apple unfolds the iOS, you know, iPhone five, iOS five, and how that they do this in a in a way that actually benefits both of those guys. Because right now, it's uh, um, I can see some value in this, but I, I'm very interested to see how this how this plays out. As always, I mean, a combustible gaseous you know blob is what uh, is what mobile is and we're just waiting for some kind of trigger to uh to start to crystallize right that's how i can describe it i think that's it jeff good good so go and check out uh you know there's a great video we'll, we'll include some links about uh, amazon fire and silk uh giga ohm mobilize uh, you know a proactive advanced conference they've recorded every single one of their sessions and they're streaming them live uh or live they're streaming the recorded uh sessions for free at gigohome.com i'll include the links up here as well and uh i would i would highly i would take a look i would recommend the uh the square uh presentation if you're interested in facebook and uh, instagram also and twitter as well was there so all of these conver- all of these topics were covered uh, at um, at mobilize and um and when you're starting to think about or considering mobile as a way uh, to extend or um, uh, move your business in a in a in a good direction, take a take a good close hard look at why you're doing it, and don't start to cannibalize your existing terrestrial or uh, web business as a result. Look for alternative ways to make some money off of this industry. God, there's so many of them. Um, but no, so those are the those are that's what we covered. Really appreciate you guys sticking around for this one hour podcast. Man. Nice and short like we planned, right? Yeah, it is. I mean, when we don't do one for a couple of weeks, we usually, uh, uh, you know, think, okay, it's going to take two hours. But uh, but I'm actually impressed that the bandwidth held up and we were actually able to record this. Um, so we, we'll endeavor to get back into a, re- a regular uh, rhythm, as we always say, but we will be back for episode number 28 at some point over the next uh, 10 or so days. Right, Jeff, you think? Absolutely. All right. Bacon. BaconOnTheGo.com, at the Suave Hog on the Twitter sphere. You can find me at Ontether.tv or at Rob Woodbridge on, on Twitter. Really appreciate the fact that you guys are uh, consistently coming to watch these, uh, these episodes or listen to them. If you have any comments or feedback, criticism, we don't care. Just bring it. Uh, we'll respond to you at anything uh, and anything that you send at us, either through Twitter or through email. You can reach me at OntetherGmail.com. And I uh, really appreciate you guys, and we will see you for episode number 28 in a while. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for doing this. Really appreciate your time. No problem. Later, everybody.